So first of all, thank you so much for no. taking the time to answer Mum's Netter's questions. No, it's a great pleasure to be with you. Uh, we've had literally hundreds me. of oh, questions <laughs> on a huge variety of issues, and we've picked the ones which are the most representative of the issues our users really care about, Perfect. so the ones that came up a lot. Yeah, great. Um, so without any further ado, because I know how busy you are, we'll get straight to it. So first up, a question, I'm gonna use usernames and they're a bit weird. So right, okay, fine. If I can read them. So the first one is from Hip Hop Op Optimus. I couldn't imagine what it's like to live a life in your very privileged financial position. How can you have the understanding and empathy about what it's like to struggle? And is it morally right for so much wealth in this country to be held by so few people? Well, Justine, I'm, you know, I'm sitting here with you talking about all of this, having this job as the result of so many people's kindness, hard work, sacrifice throughout my life. I didn't, I didn't start like this. And you know, my, if you think about it, my grandparents emigrated to this country decades ago with very little and built a life for themselves. And my parents carried that on and wanted to work hard and give up a lot to give me and my brother and sister a, a better life. Though, that was how I was raised. That was how I was brought up. And so, yes, of course, you know, now I'm in a, a fortunate position, but I didn't start like that. That's not how my family started. They put a lot in and, and gave that, as I said, for me and my brother and sister. And I never forget the values that I was raised with. And actually what I then try and do is express those values through the work I do in this job. And I'm working day and night as I have done through the pandemic and beyond to make a difference where I can. That's why I got into politics actually, because the country's done an enormous amount for me and my family. It's my way of, of trying to use all the things that have been given to me to make a difference. And, you know, people, I think, hopefully, can judge me on my actions. I always say I don't, I don't judge people by how much money they have in their bank account, right? I look at their character, their values, and, and how they're acting. And people could saw what I did during the pandemic with things like furlough, how we tried to get the country through that. And that's what I'm doing now. And that's what I'm focused on, trying to help people manage through some of the challenges we're seeing with rising prices. And I'll never forget where I came from and the values that I was raised with. And that's ultimately the thing that hopefully will make the difference. Thank you. Um, from Don Quixote de la Mancha, given you are the first chancellor in our history to have been fined for a criminal offence and not resign, do you think previous ministers who have resigned over matters of honour were fools? No, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be right for me to comment on, on other people's decisions, which of course I, I would respect. And in my own, in my own case, you know, I've always believed that I was acting within the rules and people know and I've you know, came to a meeting in the cabinet room as I do every, every, pretty much every day. Uh, but obviously, the the police concluded that I had breached the regulations. I accept and I accepted uh, that finding, and it's, you know, I apologise deeply um, for it to to everyone. And in terms of what I'm doing now, you know, I'm focused on the things that we we just touched on, and I'm sure we'll get onto as well, which is trying to help this country you know, get through a challenging period, making mm -hmm. sure we're creating the jobs that people need and helping them manage some of the prices that they're seeing. You know, that I'm working day and night at that and that's the task ahead and it's an important one and, and that's what I'm committed to doing. Okay, thank you. From Quentin in Quarantino, the IMF has downgraded the UK growth forecast to the lowest in the G7 and stated that across the Eurozone, other governments are doing far more to minimise the impact of the cost of living crisis on ordinary families. Why is the UK the outlier here? So I've just got back from Washington, actually, where all these IMF meetings were taking taking place. And to put it in context, you know, they've what they've done is actually downgraded everybody's outlook for the world, in fact, because all countries are grappling with the the rising prices that we're seeing, higher inflation. Right now, actually, at the moment, inflation in the eurozone or in the US is higher than it is here in the UK in, in the month of March that we have figures for. So these are global challenges that everyone is fighting against, and in, we're no different in that. Now, in terms of that growth forecast specifically, I think that, that's right if you look at that one specific year that uh, they're focused on. But actually, the picture is, is much better than that if you consider the fact that last year we were the fastest growing, this year we're the second fastest, and after next year, after everyone's caught up with us actually, because we've been at the front, we're, the, we're again 
second fastest and then the fastest again. And over the period, we perform really well. So I think actually, if you look at it, people should feel confident and they shouldn't think, oh, gosh, there's something wrong. They should feel actually much more optimistic about the situation economically from that perspective relative to our peers. The economic growth is actually over the period is, is good relative to peers. And where, you know, where, where we are definitely an outlier compared to the Eurozone is in employment. And so my focus has always been jobs. And I talked about that in one of my earliest interviews I had in this job. I said, yeah, I'm going to be focused on protecting people's jobs, helping them find new ones if they lose them, because I've always believed that's the best way to help people build a life for themselves, support their family, particularly now uh, with challenges on, on prices. And if you look at our unemployment rate now, it's, it's back to very low levels, 3.8%. Look at the unemployment rate in those Eurozone countries like France or Italy and Spain. It's two or three times that level. I mean, significant difference here, the performance we've had, and particularly on youth unemployment, which has always been important to me, making sure our young people always have the best possible start in life. And I was really worried during the pandemic because they worked in the industries like hospitality that were particularly impacted. And youth unemployment in this country now is, again, back below, it's actually back lower than it was before the crisis, which is an amazing result. I'm really proud of that. Again, look at what's happening in France, Italy or Spain. You've got almost a third of people in some of those young people unemployed in those countries, right? That's the difference, right? So it's a very stark difference here versus those Eurozone countries when it comes to jobs and employment, which I think is, is the best way and the most sustainable way to help people. Okay, thank you. Lemon Swan, Swan asks, we are in a Midlands town we're in our early 30s and expecting our first child this week. When we first found out we were expecting, we did the maths. We thought it's tight but doable. But with the costs of living skyrocketing, I'm now getting very concerned. And I say this as someone who felt quite well off a year ago in comparison to my peers. If we are going to struggle, then I'm seriously concerned for those on lower wages who have less disposable income to deal with rising costs. What are your plans for helping young families in particular? Yeah, well, I think first of all, and I didn't catch the name from the from yeah, the hand. Lemon, lemon well, first of all, congratulations! I think they're expecting uh, first child uh, this week, so that's exciting. I remember what that felt like. So I hope they have, I said, better luck with uh, sleeping and all the breastfeeding than than we did in those early days. <laughs> but um, the, you know, it's such an exciting time in someone's life, and actually, it's it's families like that. What is that? Why I got into politics, and, and you know, I have relatively now young kids, not that young, and you know, so helping families like that through some of the challenges they face is, is what motivates me in this in this job every every day and i know things are tough right now of course they are as we we're just talking about you know they're tough here they're tough in lots of, lots of countries and i want to do what i can to make a difference to families like that now you know there's there's a few things we've done that i think will make a difference for example you know raising the national insurance threshold by more than it's pretty much ever been raised, which meaning the first twelve and a half thousand pounds you earn will be completely free. You won't pay a penny of income tax or national insurance. There's an enormous tax cut for 30 million people in work, which I think that they're saying that they are. So it's worth 330 pounds. Uh, we've cut fuel duty for the first time in a long time and about the largest amount ever again for most people who are reliant on their cars to get around, particularly probably going to you know baby classes and all the rest of it and, uh, and parent uh, groups then that that that's helpful and again it's just keeping money in people's pocket um, but also the nine billion pounds of support we announced to help with energy bills um, which is starting to hit right now with 150 pounds rebate off most people's council tax bills so those some of the things that I think will make a difference to to that family and, and lots of others but actually I'll just you know actually the question made me think about something else as well I think a lot about the people in this situation and there's probably two things that are underappreciated. Now I'm asked to do tons of stuff all the time, all right? People are always saying, well, why can't you do this? Why can't you do that? Your first question or second question, you know? And, and, and one of the simple reasons is because there's a limit to how much we should be borrowing as a country. And I think the family there that's talking about having a mortgage and, and being a homeowner like many others. Now I'm, I'm really conscious that I don't want mortgage rates to have to go up any more than they're already going up. Now, if governments at a time like this borrow lots and lots more money, and we're already borrowing quite a lot, our own interest bill is ticking up, you know, what, what that does is risks interest rates having to go up even more. And that will just add to pressure for people with mortgage payments to make. And I want to make sure that we're careful that we don't do that and I don't make the problem worse. Mm -hmm. So that's why I can't always do everything that people want, because it actually might make the situation worse, um, particularly with those on mortgages with, with rising interest rates. But the other thing is because I care about the future, right? That, that young little baby that's about to arrive into that family, you know, my kids, everyone else's kids that are listening or watching, 
I care about them a lot. I care about the future. And so every time someone says, well, do this extra thing, which means borrow some more money to do it, what are we doing? That's all our kids. That's this new little one that we're saying, we, we, we can't deal with this problem ourselves, so we'll borrow some money and leave it to that little baby and my kids and everyone else's kids and grandkids to pick up the tab. And I, I don't think that's right. So that's why, you know, difficult as it is for me sometimes to say, no, we can't do everything. We have to pick and choose and prioritize. I don't do it because I'm being mean or I don't want to do it. I'm doing it because I'm trying to balance, you know, what's right for our kids' future as well and what's right for our country long term. And I think actually, if we think about it, we all do that in our private lives, right? We're, not, we're thinking about how do we provide a better life for our kids? That's what my parents did. I'm sure that that family's going to do. I do the same as well. And that's why actually not borrowing huge amounts and just passing that tab on to our kids is, is the right thing to do. Right. So, what, But one of the ways, as Chiswick Flo said, that you could raise some more money is to tax the energy and fuel com companies more, as other, other countries have done. Why are we not doing that? So the first thing to know is we already do. And I think people don't necessarily know that. So most companies pay around 20% in their corporation tax. The energy companies pay double that. They pay 40% they already. So they're paying 40% already. Yes, and, and they are. some of them are now making, not all of them, but some of them are now making more profits. And it does, of course, it sounds appealing and great. One tax these bad energy companies more. That will solve all our problems. Now, the reason that we haven't gone down that road is really simple. Now, we've, we're quite lucky in this country in that we've got quite a lot of energy here in the UK. And I think what we've realized is we need to invest more in that. And that's why we haven't gone for some extra tax, because what I don't want to do is discourage investment in our own energy supplies, because we want to improve our energy security. So we're not reliant on importing lots of things from abroad. And in the short term, you know, we're going to need things like gas and oil. But over time, we will phase them out and we want to get to net zero by 2050. But in the medium term, we need to rely on these things. So we'd much rather, I think all of us can agree, have, have those resources from home. And what I don't want to do is put off the investment that's required to, to exploit those resources, uh, create those jobs. And we've just seen actually from one of the large companies, they're investing, I think, 25 billion pounds in energy in the UK over the coming years. That's an enormous investment. That's great for the economy. That's great for British jobs and families around the country, particularly in Scotland. Um, and, it's, and it's also great for our long-term energy security. So that's why we haven't gone down that road because I don't want to put off investments like that. But what I'd say is, look, if, if we don't see that type of investment coming forward, right, and if the companies are not going to make those investments in, in our country and in our energy security, then, of course, that's something that, you know, I would look at. And, you know, nothing's ever off the table in these things. But right now, what I believe the right thing to do is to encourage those companies to invest so we have more energy security and support the economy. OK, thank you. A Little Miss Lego says, I'd love to know your thoughts on food banks. Why has demand for emergency food parcels risen so significantly over the last decade? And over the next five years, do you foresee our need for food banks rising, remaining static or dropping? So Little Miss Lego. Little Miss Lego. Lego, yes. Yeah, so there's a lot of my weekends. Um, so, you know, food banks, in one sense, they're quite, uh, I mean, obviously they're emotive, but also quite a complicated issue because like, as, a, as a politician and as a chancellor, I obviously want there to be less food banks. and I, I don't want people to have to, to use them. But on, on the other hand, you know, and I see it in my own constituency, I'm, I'm really grateful for the public spiritedness of, of people and charities and community groups that you know, offer them and make sure that they're there for people. So that, that's kind of, that's how I, what I think about them. Um, now, I'm, I'm glad that if you look over the last you know, 10 years since the, the coalition government and beyond, the number of people living in absolute poverty has gone down by over a million, right? Which is good, right? Because of all the various things that have been happening, there's there's over a million fewer people, even after housing costs, uh, are living in, in poverty, and that includes hundreds of thousands of children as well. So that, that's good progress, right? It reduces the need for people to rely on things like food banks. And there's a few other things specifically we're doing to help people meet food costs. There's probably three in particular I'd point out, because maybe not all uh, your kind of uh, audience will know about them. Um, the first one is the something called healthy start vouchers. So for pregnant mums or indeed mums with very young kids, you can get up to eight pounds. Uh, I think I've got eight or nine pounds a week from from memory uh, for vouchers for fresh fruit and vegetables. And in, in, if you're you know if you're on various benefits and welfare, so it's not a program that everyone knows about. So healthy start vouchers, people can look that up. I think the second thing is our breakfast club program, which is being rolled out across thousands of schools across the country um, for for schools to offer breakfast clubs 
to, to kids, which we know has an impact on their learning and, and, it, and is great. And then the third thing is something called the Holiday Activity and Food Programme that we created last year and we're spending 200 million pounds a year on. And what that does for those children on free school meals during term time, it provides several weeks of both food and activities during the holidays in all three uh, holidays. So those are the types of things that we're doing that will help make a difference with particularly food costs as and well. And do you think demand's going to go up? Or well, I would hope that it doesn't in the same way that I think we've been reducing the number of people in poverty over the last few years quite considerably. And we've got interventions like these that we've invested more in. So that all those programmes I've just mentioned are things that we have invested more in uh, over, over time and they should grow over the coming years to provide that support for people. OK, thank you. Um, Jennifer Allison Philippasu says, disabled people such as myself are particularly struggling. We have equipment that keeps us alive that we need to have in, plugged in constantly or on charge. It's costing us more and more money just to stay alive and not get sick. And disabled people who work from home like myself will have to use assistive technology to do so. And again, this uses electricity. Will you give any more support to disabled people for their bills? Oh, sure. I mean, the first thing to say, just and I see it in my own constituency when I'm talking to my constituents, is that yeah, it's not always easy for people who are not in that situation to recognise some of the challenges that those who are disabled are facing. And, you know, it's the benefit of being a constituency MP is just being able to listen a lot and learn from people's experience. And I think the other thing that comes from that is when it comes to people with disabilities, it's sort of wrong to lump them all in one, one group, actually, because everyone has quite different challenges that they're grappling with, even though they all come under the banner of, of being people with disabilities. So those are kind of the first couple of things. Uh, to say now, in terms of things that we can do to help, I think energy bills, um, you know, was mentioned. You know, as we talked about the nine billion pounds of support that there's already out there that we've put for energy. We've said we'll have to see what happens with the price cap in the autumn. Now, I know people are anxious about this and wondering if they're going to go up even more. And I've always been clear from the beginning is that we'll see what happens. And then depending on what happens to bills, then, of course, if we need to act and provide support for people, we will. I've, I've always said that. But it would be silly to do that now or last month or the month before when we don't know exactly what the situation in the autumn is going to be. So I, I'd say just, you know, let, just we'll see where we are with that if, if we need to do do more. And then the other things that we're doing, I mentioned your, I, there was many named Jennifer, uh, uh, sorry, yeah, uh, um, she, was, you know, she was working and that's brilliant because this one thing we want to do a really good job of is making sure people can work um, with their disabilities and we're spending a billion pounds uh, over a billion pounds over the next few years over this parliament to support those with disabilities into work, which is great. And then they will benefit from the tax cut that we talked about. It's coming in in July, the raising of the national insurance primary threshold. There's an extra £330 for, for most taxpayers. So that will help, um, which is great. And we're doing other things as well, like improving uh, there's something called the Disabilities Facilities Grant, which, you know, a lot, when I see in my own constituency, lots of people with disabilities, disabilities want to be able to live independently in their own homes. And actually, we have a fund that means we can make adaptations and improvements to their homes to support that kind of living. And, and again, we're putting more money into things like that as well. So there's a range of different things. And Thank you. Um, Daphne or Velma, what steps is the government taking to ensure affordable childcare is available for new parents who wish to return to work? I'm thinking particularly of parents of children under one or two to whom some of the current childcare policies, e.g. the free hours, do not apply. Yeah, so I know that this is, is such a challenge. I know, and I've, I have young kids, and, uh, and it, one of the great successes we've had over the last several years is being able to support more women to work who want to work and balance with childcare because they disproportionately are the ones that are impacted by this. And if you look at our track record on this relative to most other countries and actually relative to our history, it's, it's good in being able to enable exactly exactly that. Now, we have three different, I guess, schemes that are in place and it's, they're not always well understood, although your person there does understand them. It's, it's probably worth just running over them to make sure people are aware of what's out there. So for those on, on uh, universal credit, so those on lower incomes, actually the system reimburses 85% of all childcare costs up to about £13,000 from memory. So there's a huge amount of support within for those on the lowest incomes to actually, as I said, to reimburse almost 100%, 85% of all their childcare costs up to this quite generous cap, £13,000. Um, so that's that's for those people. And that applies, I think, universally for all ages. Now, the second thing, which is as, as um, 
as I think she was saying, we have these various policies in place to provide free childcare, 15 hours for those three to four year olds, an extra 15 hours to make it 30 if, if parents are in work, and then another 15 hours for disadvantaged families with two year olds. So that starts to get into that area that I know um, people are interested in. And then that takes me to kind of the third bucket, which again would, would apply, I think, many to many, many of your audiences, something called tax-free childcare. And this is the one that I'd love to spend 30 seconds on because I, we constantly find people aren't aware of the benefit of this. And I think it is, it's there to help people. And what this means is for when you spend eight pounds on childcare, the government basically tops up with two quid uh, and that's worth 2,000 pounds per child per year. And that again is not, and it goes all yeah. the way up to teenagers. I, so I, I could, I could have made this whole chat about uh, and how childcare. the system isn't actually quite working yeah. as well as it should. No, and, Wait, I, and I accept that. Actually, yeah, that no, and, and, I, and, I, and I accept that. And I think the first instance that we do have this yeah. thing that is providing people with up to two thousand pounds per child yeah. per year in tax-free childcare, and we know that it's not taken up as much as it should be. And one of the things we're working on is how do we improve that. So I'd love actually to get your suggestions okay. on how do we improve the operation of it. But those are the different things we have in place to, to help support people. Um, so, so the Tories and Labour seem to be taking quite a different approach to discussions around sex and gender and the importance of biology in relation to things like single sex spaces and women's sports. It's obviously something that's massively important to lots of our users. Um, so we don't want to do it, you know, there's no gotcha question here. Um, but I wondered if you'd give us just your take on how to respect both women's rights and trans rights are respecting both groups. Um, where, what's your take on that? No, I, it's a really important question. I think you know the way to do that is to have both compassion and respect. And I think you need to have compassion for those that are thinking about their identity and thinking about what that means for them, their families, and what that if, if they as they're going through potentially a change. And we need to be compassionate and, and understanding about that. And we also have to have respect. We have to have respect in particular for people's views, but particularly those views, I think, of women who are anxious that some of the things that they fought really hard for and, and that rights are important to them would be eroded uh, as well. And we need to have respect for that point of view. So that, that's my kind of general take. And I think in some of the specific, you know, what does that practically mean? You know, when it comes to questions like toilets or uh, sports, you know, I'm on a view that you know biology is important. It's it's fundamental. It's critical to how we approach those types of questions, and should that should be how policy is is reflected in that. So you you share the PM's view, I think, on what he said. That question was absolutely, from Chelsea yes. Willamina, by the way. It wasn't yeah. my question. Yeah, no, no, no. Absolutely, I absolutely do, and I think I think I think biology is is critically important as we think about some of those okay. very practical questions like toilets or. Thank or you. Sports. Last one, because everyone's waving fingers at oh, right. me. Um, so from just five more minutes, please. Do you think Boris and his cronies were behind the leaf leak of your wife's tax affairs? I do, she says. <laughs> I, I don't. <laughs> okay, thank you. That was very, um, um, well, I, I can't go without our last question, our hardy perennial on mum's debt, your favorite biscuit. Is it oh, one? right. Oh, it's actually, it is one of these ones. Yeah, these are my, these Maryland cookies are my favorite, okay. which I, this is earlier than I normally have them in the day. So this is Well, you can good take them home me. and have them well, well, thank you for thank you. I will certainly. I have one of those most days, actually. I, my, my, uh, I know people always like to take the mick out of me for my uh, Peloton that I I use. But the, the reason I have to use this Peloton is because I'm constantly eating either, you know, cookies or cake. So Twenty most minutes days. Peloton, five cookies, something uh, like that. Yeah. Oh, well, actually, that, if that's the ratio, that's good. <laughs> I can eat more cookies then. I, I, I thought it was worse than that, but good. <laughs> Thank you so much for Very taking nice the time. Very nice to you. Thanks for having me. Much appreciated.